Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our uh, panel, Mr. Muhammad Awadallah, CEO of Time Hotels. Please come to stage. Pleasure, Mr. Thank Muhammad. Ms. Mrs. You. Hala uh, Matar Shufani, uh, President of Middle East and Africa HVS. Welcome, welcome. Hi. It's a pleasure, please. And David Daniels, Director of Architecture from SSH. It's a pleasure. Tarek Dawook, uh, uh, founder and managing partner at Smart Hotels, Hospitality International. It's a pleasure. Please. So this year is about focus. And for myself and other investors and owners within the audience, we want to really get a focused understanding of uh, value engineering. So I'll start with you, Hala. What is value engineering? What are the components of value engineering? Is it uh, a Ferrari built with a Toyota budget? So what do you think? Why did you start with me? You know, <laughs> the subject is very dear to my heart, and I could talk for hours. But now I must say, I mean, this is really a focal point that listening to these uh, heated conversations that were very interesting over the last three days, it really boils down to what we're going to discuss today. And, sure. uh, you know, I don't want to be in anyone's shoes because as an independent advisor, financial advisor, I'm looking at the operator, the investor, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and every party that is involved, and everyone is protecting their interests in a way or other. And, you know, what we do every day of our life is what we call value enhancement value optimization, whatever we want to call it, it does come down to value engineering. Sure. So just to keep it simple, I mean, we look at any opportunity with a triangle. It is a triangle. Mm -hmm. It is basically on the investment side. Where is our location? What is our site? What are the demand generators and what are we building? And are we spending the right amount of money to actually develop a product where there is someone out there willing to pay. So that's one, you know, the, you know at the top. Yep. So okay. can we, can we, uh, it, that's interesting, especially starting with the investment part and uh, starting with choosing, choosing the right location. So can we value engineer the location, the site? How, Mr. Muhammad, how, how do you uh, yes. choose your sites, your locations? Is there something? Uh, called value engineering for that? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, thank you, Hala. It's actually a very good subject today. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Value engineering, we believe, as an operator, is one of the most important things in the, uh, it should be start in the ground before yep. even the location and the, and the project what you ah. want to put in this land. And uh, to be honest, in, in the Middle East, we are not everybody doing this. So that's why sometimes operators involve and try to uh, discuss the, with the uh, owner what's the best for this uh, location, like a hotel, hotel apartment, deluxe, uh, standard. Uh, maybe it can be a residence or whatever. But we have to break it down for him to make it easy and to get the return of investment what we are promised to have. So, so, so that's, that's about the product offering. So is it going to be a, maybe a, a mid-scale hotel? Is it going yes. to be a furnished apartment it, in that location? It, how, how do you choose? It's, so it's all depend of location. I, can, I, I mean, I don't yeah. know if you tell me a location now, where is the location? I can tell you after a few study or few uh, reports, I can tell you what yeah. it will be best for this location. And this is, should be a, a must even by government or by municipality to ask for this value engineering before approving any projects. Because this is, will protect the investor himself. If he put the right put, uh, project or, uh, or hotel in, this, uh, in his piece of land, he will get the right money he, uh, he spent. Yeah, uh, Tarek, you know, investors, they, they, when, when I talk to them, they say, we want to start with a luxury hotel, so go choose the land. Or, or this is the land that we have, build us a luxury hotel. What do you think, and how do these dynamics come together? The, does it make sense? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, I, I, came out, I came out to Dubai in uh, 2014, and I spent 
three months uh, looking for sites. Yep. And I think if you recall, Hala, I came to see you and we were talking about you know, just the dynamics of every uh, yeah. sub-market within Dubai. I mean, if you look at Dubai over the last 40 years, it's really developed and the hospitality market has developed quite a bit. And so we, we have like clear pockets of uh, ho hotel markets and, and diff with different dynamics. And so that's one thing to look at. Uh, and then the second is obviously the cost, the cost of the land. And, and really when I, when I went out to the market back in 14, the one thing I realized is uh, that the, the, there was a huge discrepancy between the cost of land and the, 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 the type of product that you needed to build within that particular location. And the challenge you have in a market like Dubai is, is, is unfortunately the lack of transparency when it comes to transactions because everyone wants to keep to themselves the price of the land um, and, and so that's where it becomes a bit challenging in terms of identifying the right property, uh, sorry, the right location for the right type of property. Yeah. So to answer your question, um, it, it, it's, it's not about here's my property, let's go out and build a luxury. It's, it's much more than that. There are so many layers you need to look at. Uh, and, and that's why it's important that before you even go into any hotel development, you ensure that the proper analysis and the proper kind of uh, research is done to, uh, you know, to make sure that you are delivering the right product. Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, David, uh, um, does the location or the land uh, factor in to the design process and, and from the investment side? Definitely. I yep. mean, for us uh, as a practice, context is probably the first thing that we actually start with. Obviously, the feasibility studies factor a lot of what the hotel is going to function and look like materiality-wise, spatially, things like that. But the context of the site, that's probably one of the most important elements. If you have a beachside residence, it's going to factor massively into the design of the hotel and how it operates. Yep. I mean, if it's a mountainside, then obviously it's going to be different. Yep. It's also going to, if you've got a plot which is sat between existing buildings, it, naturally it's going to become something that's probably more set back, more intimate. So yeah, context for us is um, a massive driver. Tala, is it true that uh, when we factor in the land price, all financial models are uh, for investment break up? Not necessarily, oh. but I mean, back to your question, obviously there are sites that are not suitable. I wouldn't qualify them as bad sites. We were asked to come in and asset manage a property that is existing up and running, and it is what we would describe a secondary location with a four-star operator and a six-star finishing. Uh -huh. yeah. So obviously this is the triangle I was talking about. It's a whole lot of mismatch. Now forget about what is there now. That site mm -hmm. is a prime site for a budget hotel that is attached to the mall because that mall is a mid-range mall. Mm -hmm. And in those locations, no, obviously the cost of land is not gonna kill the project. Okay. So, you know, again, back to his point, if you are looking to develop mid-scale hotel, you may not necessarily be looking at prime locations and prime site. You are in a different demand generator zone. But yes, I mean, I, again, this is a whole other discussion in the Middle East. How do we value land? Oftentimes, the lands are not necessarily valued in what we perceive to be in a transactional way. And therefore, you know, if your cost of land is suddenly 50% of your total development cost, your RRR is going to either be reduced or even show a negative. Uh, it becomes even more difficult when we're asked not to include land in the development, which uh, obviously yeah. So, make sense. so the, the cost of land is, let's say, the weakest link within the value engineering process, or uh, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily no. agree. I still yeah. think, essentially, from an investment, the cost of land the cost of built. Yep. I mean, it's all very good to have a lot of fancy design, but we've sat on a, a lot of value engineering exercises that before you know it, you've saved 40% on total cost and increased IRR from six to 10%. Yeah, so. Uh, it's significant reductions uh -huh. and you're still delivering the right the, product. Yeah. Okay. So, so you think you, you think the best area to let's say value engineer our product or offering is in the construction costs? Let's it's say a, I think it's yeah. in all. 
<laughs> even in the technology side, in the building, in the material used, uh, in the design, in everything. And I believe if they start from the beginning, as Hala just mentioned, you can go to a, s a big amount of saving. Uh, it can reach to 60%. I totally agree. Yeah, but owners, uh, they usually, well, after they do their feasibility study, they put it aside, then they go to uh, David and tell them, I want to design something fancy, something unique, something out of this world. So, so and they forget about the budget. So, so how, do, how, does it, uh, how does it work with you? What do you think is the best, let's say, trade-off? Or what do you advise your clients? Every architect loves to have an unlimited budget. But if you're a yeah. sensible architect, you know that doesn't exist. The reality is you'll spend so much time designing spectacular things. Yep. And then as soon as the QS comes in and tells the client it's going to be 100% above your budget or whatever, yeah. the worst thing you can do then is use value engineering as a tool not as it's what it's intended to be, but to use it as a cost-cutting exercise. Because then your product you get at the end isn't anything that actually matches what the brief is. The way we like to work from an integrated design point of view is exactly what the, the panelists were saying. is about throughout the entire process, we're always watching what we're designing. We're always designing in a manner that we're not adding things or subtracting things. They're integral throughout the process. Structural engineering, a massive element. There is large amounts of money if you design the product in a particular manner or in a specific way that large swathes of money can be saved on the structure. MEP, if it's integrated yeah. properly, yeah. if it's actually designed from the outset with the architecture, with the structure, savings can be made there. Well, not savings, optimizations. I hate that word savings, but optimizations so that it's efficient. And that for me is really what value engineering is, is about yeah. creating efficient design design which offers something to the product after it's completed as well, you know? Looking into the future of how the, how the product is going to actually be uh, utilized, how it can be flexible, as you were saying, you know, there are some sites where uh, there's a four star and actually it should be a three star and the design should be in s yeah. done in such a way that it allows for that change in the future, that growth and that development because areas of cities do change. Yeah. Um, customer dynamics change. And so if the hotel is designed, or the asset is designed at the beginning with that flexibility in mind, then that's how I see as an architect of added value being created. Yeah, so uh, featuring it, yeah, as a contractor personally, we are squeezed in usually between the owners, the designers, and the operators. So the designers that are adamant about uh, their designs, they don't want to change anything, the owners, they come to us shouting, we need to lower the cost, we need to lower the cost, value engineer the material, value engineer the design. So how, uh, how does uh, uh, the flexibility of the operators, how does it, how does it factor in? Do, do the operators, let's say, need to be more flexible with the owners, with the designers, about abiding by the brand standards? I think, I mean, uh, what's, what's great about the large if you want to call them five, six uh, global hotel players, is that they've been, uh, they are and they have been uh, real estate owners in the past, so they understand real estate. Uh, that, that doesn't mean, though, that, that it kind of uh, changes their view on what they want at a property. I mean, operators are always looking for what's easy for them to operate, and they sometimes forget the impact of what that cost would be uh, to the owner or to the investor. So I think uh, really, uh, What's important is to figure out ways to align everyone's interests. So you talk about you know, the contractor, the investor, and the uh, operator. I think what's, what's key really is, is to ensure that uh, before the, even the project starts, that everyone agrees to what's being developed um, and, and really have a proper alignment from every uh, party involved. Uh, I think when operators do put money on the table, that helps the quite, quite significantly as well. Uh, as, as smart hotels, we are uh, an op owner operator, so we are vested in uh, Form Hotel, which is our first property here in Dubai. Well, not here, but in Dubai. Um, and the reason why we are invested is because we want to ensure uh, that we are aligned with the with our you know broader investor group. Uh, and 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 with that, obviously, it's had it helped facilitate our conversations as an operator for what we require or what we need the property. So I'll give you an example which is quite uh, interesting. So we have a, a, a rooftop pool at our property yep. and initially the designer 
uh, looked at it and said, yeah, we, we just want to make it a bit smaller so that we have uh, more space for sunbeds. And the view really was, well, I mean, if, if it's going to be a small pool, the rooftop, then why, why even have a pool? Uh, so we took a very different a view on what we should do from a design perspective. Ultimately, we have a 22-meter uh, length pool where it's, it's, it's a proper pool where you can properly swim in a, in a property uh, on a plot that's 1,100 square meters. So th this is the type of dialogue that all the various parties need to have together in order to, to ensure uh, alignment. Uh, and then obviously drive value, which is, you know, which is the end goal of every, of every player. Now designers, they're, they're quite unique, but you have some designers that understand hotels more than others. Uh, and obviously, I would recommend for any developer or, or uh, you know, contractors to really identify those designers that truly understand how hotels operate. Yep. Uh, thanks for that. The, uh the investors, yeah, some of the, the investors that, that we talked to, they want to cut costs, the construction costs. So what they do is that, all right, we don't want an ask manager. We don't want a lead consultant on board. Let's get the contractor. Let's buy the material for the contractor and let him do the execution. How, how, do, how do, you know, is that a reliable model? We have some people here actually yeah. that managed, managed their construction by themselves. So what do you think? Um, I mean, Tom? This will always happen, and especially here in the Middle East, you cannot change. I mean, the only things you can try to correct or to advise or educate the owner to change, but sometimes you cannot, and that's why we have few mistakes in the hotel, yeah. and especially, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, even in Dubai, I mean, there is a lot of big uh, establishment, they, are, they have uh, major mistakes in operation because they did not consult or they did not listen to the uh, professionals uh, in, the, in the earlier stage, which they're correcting now. And even us, we have some example where is things are built and it's totally wrong. But yeah, it's difficult. I, uh, this is what I'm facing, unless my one of my colleagues has a different opinion. I, uh, no, I definitely add to that. I mean, when we're talking about value engineering is that the operator's input and architects and designers that have worked with hotel is very important. The downside of this conversation is, as well, if we overvalue engineer a project. Yep. And therefore, once it's open and running, it is quite inefficient that yep. the operator is not able to perform and devalues the assets. So up front, we've made savings, but on exit, we've actually devalued the assets. Mm -hmm. Hence why this whole value engineering has to have an end goal of value optimization and finding that sort of balance yeah. is really key in that equation. Uh, th so that's, sorry, I just yeah, want sure. to add this because this is very important because a lot of us, especially operator or any even in, 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 in a human being, we just say, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. But you have to explain why it's wrong. And this is the key. And some of the owners, they understand when you explain to them after operation, if you open and this door will hit that and will break that and it will not reach the right service to the clients, he will understand. But from the beginning and you start to argue and he's of course, he's the owner, the uh, owner jacket and you have to uh, operator and it's my standard and the conflict to start. Yeah, I mean so I, 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 would yeah. say, I would say there's uh, also um, an important distinction to make, which is, uh, there's a difference between ego capital and smart capital. Yeah. And uh, it's important that, uh, you know, s capital remains smart and not uh, ego driven. Um, now, th it's not a, you know, at the end of the day, uh, people may always tell you, well, yeah, I mean, I've made my wealth because I'm smart, and so I know what I'm doing. But I think what I mean by smart capital is, is, a, is really a capital uh, investor like you know that that really understands uh, the various players involved and finds a way to align all these investors uh, all these players and so when you to your point earlier which is you know we have this site we want a luxury hotel and this is usually ego driven yeah uh, and 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 so then the question is uh, you know does it make sense and and that's where sometimes there's you know there's a a shortfall and uh, you see a lot of these examples uh, throughout the world it's not only the Middle East 
Yeah, but and this is a mistake of the big operators because sometimes, including us, because sometimes we signed and it's still signed and he yeah. know that this project is not right for yeah. this space of plant yeah. and still approve it. Yeah, yeah I mean, you, you see, <laughs> you know, you could see a property, for yeah, instance, it's true. Uh, that's, it's built, unbelievable. <laughs> that's built out as a resort, but it doesn't have a beach yeah. in a city that's predominantly beach driven from a leisure perspective. So you know that it's going to struggle. Um, so there are ways to, uh, you know, I, I think f from, from the point of our discussion today, value engineering has to start from the beginning. And it's at every stage of the process, uh, up until even uh, down to where the operator has to value engineer the way they operate. Uh, and, and even in terms of how they target their customers, whether it's you know, in terms of their market segmentation and how they go out to get the business. You know, do we have high reliance on uh, online travel agents? Do we build a strong business so that we can yield, uh, base business so we can yield uh, more throughout the year? That's all value engineering. David, uh, well, do you think that um, the owners should give the, the uh, process of value engineering to the designers or the contractors? So I think to both of them. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is one of the things. It's um, the, uh, successful projects is generally when the team is very close and collaborative. Communication is strong, um, or it's, it's not not our side and their not, side. And it should never be like that. I think the closer the, the relationship between a contractor, a client, an operator, a designer, the engineers, the, the closer that team is, the more collaborative that team is, the more open to suggestions from each party, yeah. the better the product is at the end. Because it's only, it's like, if you go to your doctor, he'll tell you what the big picture is, your general practitioner, but he'll send you to a specialist to tell you, you know, if your ears are wrong or your eyes are wrong. Um, if you come to me as an architect, I can tell, me, tell you what the big picture is, but I'll send you to my structural engineer to tell you how thick a column should be. You know, and so you have to listen to that professional. That's so. Cool. For me, the, the, the statement of who should it belong to, the contractor or to the designer, I, I don't buy into that philosophy at all because there should be a relationship as early as possible between the contractor and the designers. Because yep. there will be things in the market that the contractor will know that as a designer, we have no visibility of. And vice versa, because of the design aesthetic of a building, because of the spatial flows of a building, there are things that a designer will know that a contractor doesn't understand. Working together, there's a middle ground that needs to be reached rather than the extremes from each end of it, which is what happens if it's given to one or the other. Is you get the extremes of that profession. Yeah. But yeah. Ismail, if I can add, yeah. uh, it's also very important to, s to continue to have your financial advisors on board, especially for complex mixed use uh, developments. Any change, whether on the contracting side, architecture, should be plugged in back into the financial modeling to understand where is the uplift in revenue, if at all, mm. and how does that impact the IRR? Because to asset managed after the development is complete, something different than the basis of why this development was made is very difficult. Yep. No, sure, yeah, sure. you're right. I, uh, if I may add, yeah, I sure. think, as you said, it has to be all together. But the, the, the value engineer, it should be the, the first because he will tell him what to do in this uh, piece of land or in this project, the right things to do. And then everybody has to have a meeting and, and move forward. And I, I believe, I mean, from here, it should be even by governmental issue that you cannot approve any construction till you have the value engineer report. Yeah, like Europe, I think you cannot start the report project. I think uh, there's project. an interesting uh, connotation for everyone in this room to, to keep in mind. Um, the higher uh, cost of capital that you have, the higher the degree of value engineering is necessary. You know, it's a direct correlation. So if you're an operator, <coughs> the higher the fees that you want to try and achieve, whether it's from your base or incentive or other fees, um, the higher the importance of value engineering is. And it's, it's really simple. Really? So, I mean, if everyone has that uh, view, then to what we were saying earlier, it's about how you explain it to the party you're dealing with. To, to, to basically essentially convince them that your recommendations are to everyone's benefit. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Uh, does anyone have questions in the audience?
No, please. No. Can we have the mic over here, please? We can uh, move for. No, no. I just have a very quick question for David. I yeah. Body engineering seems to be a corrective action, but there's not a lot of preventive action, so it's reversing the word, engineering value. And, uh, and to the point, in many industries, they're using uh, building information modeling to optimize building and achieve that. How much of that is actually incorporated into the design profession today, not necessarily in the own firm in general? And the second question is, ALA and other consultants spend a lot of time doing feasibility studies, and their revenue are derived by a certain space program recommended according to the demand of their asset type. How much importance do you give to the revenue side of things when you start changing their design? Okay, so first off, we'll touch on to the BIM thing. BIM, BIM is relatively young in our industry. Um, it is picking up a lot of gravitas and a lot of speed. It is becoming far more prevalent without the industry. Um, it's something at SSH we use, uh, we, we put great onus on, um, especially because we're multidisciplinary. So it helps us from a term of actual coordination and from a realization of a design, actually making it feasible, making it actually buildable. Um, and what it also does, which we're trying to push further into the market is it gives more cost certainty as well because it's very easy to measure from a BIM model. It's much more accurate and it's much more um, um, easier to get the information out of rather than physically measuring things and that with the QS and that. Um, it also allows us to actually continuously measure as we go along if the team is set up correctly. And that's another thing really. The QS usually only appears at the end of each stage of design. The reality is that QS should be throughout the life cycle of the design process, and he should be constantly reporting into the other bodies to say what his findings are and recommendations are. Yeah. Um, to touch on the client's feasibility and the revenue streams defined by the space planning, that for us is very important. I mean, that drives the design. Uh, there are architects, there are designers in the world that design beautiful, iconic buildings, and on the inside of it, it, they try and just force everything back in. For us, it's the other way around. We're quite traditional in that sense, that form follows function. Um, so the space planning, to be honest, you know, the, the, the moment you arrive at a building, yes, there is a moment of wow, but it's how you experience the inside of a building that actually matters to the, to the guest. So for us, the, the space planning feasibility is very, very important. And when that changes, that change generally, I would say, on a lot of our buildings isn't by ourselves. It's generally because the feasibility has been evolving and the client or the operator has requested something to make that change. So, I, 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 yeah. Thank you, uh, David. We've run out of time today. Thank you for, for your support here. Thought I heard that uh, we have some very good news today. Yeah. So congratulations on signing the next deal thank for Smart Hotels. Yeah. And uh, thank you, thank you, Mabruk. gentlemen. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ahlan. Pleasure.